five millennia ago, Egypt was ruled by a pharaoh and watched over by the gods. Math had its origins in this land where a great river flooded an arid desert. The ancient Egyptians developed mathematical methods in order to measure land and tax it. Their civilization was built with geometry as its foundation. This new field of math brought to the world a new civilization on land, reborn each year. Athens is the sixth most popular tourist destination in the world. What visitors are looking for in this city is not the present. Like me, they are seeking an ancient state that flourished two and a half millennia ago. The ancient forebearers of today's Greeks were eager to learn new things. And in their quest, they were in no way reluctant to take in other cultures. They completely absorbed the customs and knowledge of others, assimilated them into their own, and created a new culture. Today, we'll be introduced to a region and a book. Many people who lived during this short but dynamic period tried to understand things that were not visible to the human eye. And they recorded their findings in an important book. What's in the book has been read over and over again for two millennia. I have read it, and you probably have too. Just now, I have entered the very soul of Western civilization. It is said that the origins of Western culture lie with ancient Greece. The ancient Greece that I'm searching for is not its unique structures, but its spirit. And that spirit can be found in this library. We've read a lot about the ancient Greeks. We've learned a great deal about Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Greek mythology. But the most read book is not among them. It is this book. Euclid's The Elements was the king's math textbook in those days. 
Ptolemy I, a ruler of ancient Egypt, was required to learn not only logic, ethics, and philosophy, but also math. Math was an especially important subject for the king. His teacher has arrived. He is the author of Elements, a Greek named Euclid. But why did the lofty king of Egypt have to learn math? At first glance, Elements is full of unfamiliar diagrams. It's interesting to know that the king was tasked with learning all of this. Here, I found the first diagram, which answers the questions we raised. This man lived in the same period as Buddha, Confucius, and Lao Tzu. Pythagoras was a prophet and a mystic. He was known as a student of the philosopher Thales. He traveled around Egypt and Babylon for more than 20 years before returning to his hometown of Samos in Greece. He wonders, what is this world made of? Scholars of ancient Greece were eager to find theories that would explain the hidden meaning of objects. Pythagoras himself took a long journey to find the answers to those questions. In the middle of the Egyptian desert, there was an enormous structure built 2,000 years earlier even older than the Parthenon in Athens. What Pythagoras witnessed then wasn't what we see today. The pyramids were splendid structures that reflected sunlight on one side. But this wandering Greek saw something the Egyptians were not interested in. It was a simple figure that transcended the magnificence of the pyramids. The vast right triangle of the pyramid is the same as this small right triangle. The Egyptians knew the ratio necessary to create a right triangle. Three to four to five. How can these numbers make up a right triangle? Pythagoras saw something even more amazing in Babylon. This Babylonian tablet contains a series of numbers. Let's write these cuneiform numerals in modern form. 119, 169, 3,367, 4,825. These were numbers besides 3, 4, and 5, 
that constituted right triangles. There are many three number combinations that comprise right triangles. But why do certain numbers work and others don't? Pythagoras found hints in his hometown of Samos in Greece. Samos is a small island located in southeastern Greece. The name Pythagoras is still such a source of pride that the port itself was named after him. Today, this place that is home to 50,000 people is a minor tourist destination. But long ago, it was a major commercial center of ancient Greece. Thank you. I have some today. Maybe time for clear. Pythagoras left Samos as an unknown, but he returned as a figure famous throughout Greece. This is because of the right triangle we have all learned about. The famed formula central to right triangles bears his name, the Pythagorean theorem. But the Egyptians and Babylonians already knew about this ratio, so how come it was named after Pythagoras? such beautiful music. And within this instrument, there lies a hint. Even back home, Pythagoras continued to pursue the numbers he found in Egypt and Babylon. This man of ancient Greece loved to think. He would never give up. One day, he heard sounds from a blacksmith's workshop as he passed by. It was a sound he'd always loathed. But on that particular day, he found himself enjoying it. What made the sound pleasing that day when he usually felt the opposite? The temperature of the fire? A different metallic material. What on earth created the difference? The secret lay with the length. It was the numbers of beta and gamma, two and three. The length of the number two and the three that Pythagoras found were the notes do and so. They make the perfect music interval five notes apart. two and three. In other words, the ratio of two to three could turn anything into harmony. Pythagoras moved forward with this discovery. If two-thirds could produce harmony, then two-thirds of the previous two-third would also be harmonious. A line and two-thirds of that line would make harmony. B 
based on this theory, Pythagoras continued to find harmonious sounds. These are the sounds created by progressively following each string by two-thirds of its predecessor. We put them in a different order. We make them longer using the same ratio of length. Shall we listen again? This is how the seven scales we know today were created. Pythagoras finally came to know the secret of what creates harmony. Music is an infinite treasure taking us to a wondrous world. Before the age of Pythagoras, music was thought to be a thing of beauty that created itself. But our quest for the origins of this notion led us to a special ratio of numbers. In other words, a harmonious ratio of numbers. Does this harmonious ratio of integers found in musical notes only exist in music itself? Pythagoras found the answer to this age-old question. The world is made up of ratios of integers. Pythagoras made great waves in a Greek society that was determined to find the principles, like water and earth, that rule the world. Invisible numbers made up this creation. Pythagoras had invited the Greeks into a spiritual world. he found the relationship between the numbers he saw in Egypt and Babylon. This was the relationship of the three sides of a right triangle. Today, we call this the Pythagorean Theorem. Whether they're large or small, whether on land or on sea, all right triangles in the universe follow the Pythagorean Theorem. The Pythagorean theorem holds that the sum of the square of A and the square of B is equal to the square of C. In other words, if you combine the area of the squares that have sides of A and B, you get an area equal to a square with side C. All the right triangles in the world satisfy this formula. The numbers Pythagoras saw in Egypt and Babylon were these numbers. It is no exaggeration to say that math began with Pythagoras. The reason we remember Pythagoras is that he created laws through proofs. The Egyptians and Babylonians knew of the existence of these special numbers, but didn't know the laws behind them. But thanks to Pythagoras, math was instilled with a spirit. and the right triangle 
belongs to him forever. You can encounter this beautiful sea by driving anywhere in Greece. Although an archipelago of some 1,400 islands make up much of this country, Pythagoras's philosophy spread throughout Greece. Let's travel ourselves back to one century after his time. This young man perusing a text is Hippasus. He was a follower of the Pythagorean philosophy. He vigorously pursued Pythagoras' faith and became a follower, but he raised some troubling questions. One of his concerns lay with the right triangle, Pythagoras' proudest achievement. Members of the Pythagorean school wore bright white clothing. They frequently discussed philosophy and the results of their research. They argued with one voice against their opponents. They held firmly to the belief that the world was made up of the ratio of integers. Hippasus was one of these devotees. On this day, Xenovalea was involved in heated debate. He is attacking the integer theory held by Pythagoras. Shall we have a listen? Achilles and a turtle are in a running race. If the turtle starts a few meters ahead, Achilles will never overtake it. Why is that? Achilles reaches the point where the turtle is. The turtle runs forward while he catches up. Achilles closes the gap again. But in the meantime, the turtle has moved forward. At this rate, Achilles would never overtake the turtle, no matter what. Zeno attacked Pythagoras' integer theory in this way. The gauntlet had been thrown down. Would the Pythagoreans take it up? The Pythagorean disciples could not disprove Zeno, which was natural in those days. Zeno's argument carried the notion of infinity, which was such a complicated concept that it didn't truly develop until the 19th century A.D. The Pythagorean school was liberal enough to open its membership to females, but it wanted to maintain confidentiality. Thus, its members took an oath not to disclose their knowledge to the outside world. When they did publish their results, it was not as individuals, but under the name of the school. Pythagoras' beliefs that the world is composed of the ratio of integers was an absolute article of faith applied to the entire universe. It's not unreasonable to say that the nature of this group was religious, even cult-like. Hippasus also took the oath of secrecy. He could not betray their confidence. In addition, he was burdened by a truth that couldn't be accepted by the other disciples.
The Pythagorean theorem holds that the sum of the square of A and the square of B is equal to the square of C. But if the value of both A and B is 1, what would be the value of C? In other words, what would be the number if its square is 2? We must find out that number. The answer is located somewhere between 1 and 2. 1.4 1 4 2 They thought they could find it if they kept narrowing it down. But Apasus realized that the number did not exist. And that would mean the collapse of Pythagoras' world made up of integers. What Apasus had discovered was a new number that so far had not existed. It was the square root of 2. It is an irrational number. Hippasus saw a world that transcended that of Pythagoras. his fellow disciples were after him. He is the one who broke the sacred rules. Sometimes an era cannot accept a truth that breaks the bonds of its common sense. His friends could not just let it go. The truth brought him to the edge of a cliff. For his transgression, it is said that the disciples of Pythagoras drowned Hippasus to death. But his discovery has long outlived poor Hippasus. Hippasus proved that the value of the square root of 2 could not be expressed with any numbers that existed at the time. That meant the existence of a whole new set of numbers. How did Hippasus know that a world of invisible numbers existed? That was possible thanks to the power of proofs. What is this world made of? The Greeks fiercely debated this subject. Some said water. Others said fire. Arguments led to more arguments. The Greeks who argued verbally made up their own narrative style. This led to what is called proofs. The proof came from math, which in those days was geometry. All of geometry originates from points. Without a definition of a point, geometry could not move forward. We call this a point. But if it is enlarged even a little, its meaning becomes vague. Is this a point or a circle? In mathematics, points are not something real, but rather an abstract concept of logic. 
Many Greek scholars were bogged down on this question. What is the definition of a point? Here the great Greek philosophers gather together. The first person to define a point was Pythagoras. He declared that it was a monad, with no space but with a location. His student Plato defined a point as the beginning of a line. So he defined a point as an undivided line. Aristotle argued against his teacher Plato. If a point is an unbreakable line, there must be an end. So what is that end? Euclid cited all the theories on points from various philosophers and came to a conclusion. A point is unbreakable. This is the first line in his book, Elements. and a line, and an area. The elements begins with 23 definitions. Ptolemy's elements class gets intense. Those 23 definitions didn't belong solely to Euclid, but to all of Greece. Euclid taught how to prove things to the king by using these definitions. This is a legacy to those who interpreted the world with the help of the definitions found in elements. This entire structure raised up stone by stone from its foundation is typical of the ancient Greek's mindset. Thinking, too, requires a cornerstone of philosophy. Postulates play the role of something that cannot be proven, but is correct. In Euclid's Elements, five postulates are introduced. The first postulate. A straight line can be drawn from any point to any point. This seems indisputable, but the Greeks were quite meticulous. The second postulate. A straight line can be extended indefinitely. Thirdly, a circle may be described with any given point as its center and any distance as its radius. Fourth, every right angle is equal to one another. And finally, parallel lines can never meet each other. It has been 2,000 years since that book was first released it still has an influence in our modern lives. 
It seems complicated, but contemporary societies built upon mutually agreed postulates. This is the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, a symbol of the American independence and freedom. She is holding the Declaration of Independence in her left hand. The Declaration of Independence itself follows the structure of Euclid's elements. It begins with a postulate that all men are created equal. It concludes with a demand for independence from British rule. Many books such as Isaac Newton's Principia or Ethics by Baruch de Spinoza follow the writing style of elements. Elements is a near-perfect text that makes the heart of many intellectuals beat faster. Make a regular triangle with a line. This is the first problem in elements. Can we simply draw it randomly? No, we can't. We have to begin from an agreed upon starting point. The teacher says that we must use these definitions and postulates. The first problem is therefore very simple and easy. Keep the five postulates in mind. Use the third postulate. First, draw a circle. Then, we draw another. Next, the first postulate is used. Then connect this point with that. We're all set. Three lines form the radius of one circle. Their length is the same, so it's an equilateral triangle. Pythagoras proved his right triangle with methods found in elements. Many modern mathematicians use them as well. Elements began with Pythagoras and was completed by Euclid. It became a permanent part of mathematical language. After the class, the king asks a question. Are you by any chance looking for a simpler path? I feel the spirit of these great scholars who forged the spirit of ancient Greece. I pause for a while in this world of precise logic to which they had devoted themselves.
Proofs in ancient Greece was a process of taking each logical step one by one. Jumping to a conclusion was simply unacceptable. The completion of perfect logic requires a great deal of precision at any stage. There is no easy way to jump across steps. The spirit of this period is the essence of ancient Greece and civilization. It sounds difficult, but it's a very important lesson. Millions of people from all over the world still visit Greece. What they're looking for is not present-day country, but the ancient state of Greece that flourished two and a half millennia ago. They are seeking the Greek spirit.